I think that we are a few minutes after one. I want to respect everyone's time today. Uh, my name is Joey Shelton, uh, the dean of the chapel here at Millsaps College and director of church relations. And want to uh, give you a little background on what we've done here. The summer's lectures, long time uh, lectures for Millsaps College. Uh, it is uh, administrated by the Department of Religious Studies here at Millsaps. I want to thank Dr. Bowley for all of his help with us coordinating uh, the Galloway Lewis Lecture Series and the Summers Lecture Series. So I think this is a great partnership and we're really looking forward to things that the future offers us and all of that. So for our pastors and, uh, that are seeking uh, continuing education, we're going to have a pastor's clergy roundtable this afternoon at uh, 4 o'clock. So if you'll please stay after the reception for that. And tomorrow, uh, we will have uh, lectures and sessions at Galloway. Um, what time do we begin at Galloway, Carrie? Nine. Nine. Start, but come drink coffee with us at 8.30. 9 a.m. So if you're... Uh, if your taste buds get enlivened with the conversation today, there will be lots more tomorrow. Might, you know, the game day is here tomorrow. So I don't know what that means for traffic and, and all that, but ESPN game days at Jackson State in the morning. So keep that in mind as you drive into Galloway tomorrow. Okay. Everybody got that? I told the Ellen this morning that she is competing with prime time tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So our speaker, we're so pleased to have Ellen Ott Marshall. She teaches at the Divinity School at Candler, Emory University, and uh, we are thrilled that she's here. She's uh, educated from Notre Dame and Vanderbilt, at least if not more places. I don't remember all of them, but she can tell you that when she gets up here. She's a delightful human being. And our country at this time, especially uh, in these midterm elections and in the atmosphere of the United Methodist Church, we're filled with conflict. And that is what she writes about and we think this is an extremely timely um, conversation for us to have today. Do before uh, we ask Ellen to come forward, we want to recognize T.W. Lewis, who is here with us today. And uh, when we start at 1 o'clock, Dr. Bowley is going to introduce our panelists for the uh, panelist response today. So thank you all. Dr. Ellen Ott Marshall, thank you. Am I allowed to have water up here on this very nice new podium? <laughs> Put it way over there. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to put it all the way down here. All right, good afternoon. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this, and I so appreciate the invitation. And I keep saying I um, have been on the hosting end of events like this before, and I know how much work <laughs> goes into the logistics and planning. And, and I'm just really grateful for all of that labor um, and the hospitality to make me feel welcome here. Um, I'm grateful for this event. I'm mindful of my faculty colleagues who are taking time out. I know you all do not have time for this. That's just a, a reality. And so I appreciate um, the sort of maneuvering you've had to do to create some space to be here. So thank you so much. So our focus this afternoon is on the role and responsibilities of universities and of churches in contexts of violence. <clears throat> now that is a heavy and huge topic, even more so when we admit the reality that every context is 
or potentially is a overt, physical, already manifest in hurting bodies, but it's also covert, structural, psychological, emotional, spiritual, still manifest in hurting bodies, but less visible. So the question of our roles and responsibilities and contexts of violence is an essential subject for us to address, and it's an essential subject for us to address together. Violence is an inherently interdisciplinary problem. <laughs> there are multiple contributing factors, and we need the insights and expertise from many fields of study to understand and address it. It is also a cross-vocational problem. That is, every vocation represented in what I assume to be a pretty diverse room has a role to play in addressing violence understanding it, mitigating it, repairing the harm it does, building systems and communities of resilience, justice, and care. This is a common problem that pulls all of us into shared work. So my very small piece of this massive work is to offer some reflections on a central conviction in Christian theology and ethics, namely the image of God. This is my piece because my vocation is teaching Christian ethics. I am fascinated with the connections between beliefs and actions, with the ways that believers draw on their faith to interpret circumstance and shape a response. I'm also very concerned about the ways that my faith tradition, Christianity, contributes to various forms of violence, motivating acts of hate, sustaining practices of exclusion, ignoring forms of justice, injustice. So part of my vocation is not only teaching Christian ethics, but helping my students to think critically about the tradition they love, or at least the tradition they grew up in, <laughs> or maybe the tradition they long ago left but still have some kind of weird attachment to. In my own critical reflections, I have thought a lot about the image of God. This powerful and evocative concept has been used historically and continues to be used to make distinctions between the value of persons. It has also been used positively as a theological grounding for resistance to oppression and exclusion and as a, as a theological denunciation of violence. Because of its power to affirm and to hold us accountable, the image of God functions as a resource for resisting violence. It is a resource for religious peace building. Now, I'm going to talk for about 35 more minutes, <clears throat> which is out of keeping with all of the trends on uh, effective communication and uh, um, attention spans. So let me tell you just three things up front that I really hope you get out of this talk. The first is that the image of God is a dynamic concept that has accrued meaning over time, and that's okay. That's the first point. The second is that the image of God is a powerful political claim, and that warrants attention and care. The third is that the image of God is a resource for religious peace building because it affirms all life as sacred and holds us accountable to one another. So searching through my library's catalog, and I have to pause to say that our head librarian insists that we have the best theological library in the world. So I have to, Bo Adams would want me to say that. So searching through my library's uh, catalog at uh, Emory, at Candler, using image of God as the exact subject yields 153 books. When I expand the search to include articles, that yield jumps to 502. If I expand the search even further, so all materials that contain the phrase image of God, 3,336 items turn up. Of course, to get a real beat on contemporary engagement with the phrase, we need to search in other places like Google 
which generates 35,600,000 hits in 0.37 seconds. Hashtag image of God is quite an active Twitter account. There are multiple Instagram accounts and podcasts for image of God as well. And now I just gave you something related to this lecture to do on your phones. So <laughs> you're welcome. The image of God does not just enter into contemporary conversation frequently, it enters in authoritatively. The doctrine of Imago Dei anchors arguments for human rights, economic rights, civil rights, cultural rights. It grounds ministries serving people experiencing homelessness, undocumented migrants, and other marginalized persons. It even informs opposing sides, both sides, in debates over abortion, the death penalty, war, and euthanasia. By its frequency and weight, the Imago Dei is massive. And yet, there is almost a cartoonish discrepancy between the mass of material and the tiny scriptural basis on which it sits. The key biblical text for the image of God is Genesis 1, 26, 27. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Now beyond this key text, we find a few more rather passing references. The genealogy offered in, Gen in Genesis 5 opens with this reminder. When God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. In Genesis 9, we find God's covenant with Noah, which includes this mandate. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For his own image, God made humankind. We find two more references in the New Testament. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he mentions the image of God, but adds a distinction based on gender to explain why women should cover their heads. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God but woman is the reflection of man. And I'm just gonna set that just right over here for now. We're just gonna <laughs> set it over there and take a breath, recenter. <laughs> James also references the image of God in the course of his appeal to tame the tongue, which utters both blessings and curses. With the tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. Now, as my Emory colleague Ian McFarland argues, the phrase is evocative for sure, but its presence in scripture is sporadic and infrequent. This would seem to caution against granting image of God much authority, and yet for much of Christian theology, the image of God arises as, and this is Ian's language, the key to formulating the Christian doctrine of human being. Similarly, in my field of Christian ethics, Imago Dei features prominently in moral discernment and ethical argumentation over social, political, economic, and biomedical questions. Sometimes, like Paul, Christian ethicists reference the image of God to make distinctions among persons or to set persons apart from creation. In other places, one finds argumentation akin to that of James concern about the way we treat others in light of the fact that we are made, all made, in the image of God. More about those arguments in a minute. But first, what are we to make of this remarkable fertility of these very few scriptural verses? Well, one way to make sense of it is to think about um, the historical nature of a construing belief. Historical nature, construing belief. The psychologist of religion, Julian Hart, described a construing belief as a concept through which we interpret the world. For example, I see a yucca plant shooting its white flower up from a burned hillside, and I say, ah, resurrection. <laughs> Life asserts itself even in the midst of destruction. Now, what is actually happening 
well, although there's apparently dispute over the relationship between yucca plants and fire, there seems to be general agreement that some yucca plants over five years old not only withstand fire, but actually are stimulated to flower because of fire. So I am seeing a plant responding to intense, intense heat. I am construing it as resurrection. Construing beliefs also work the other way around. Having lived in Southern California where we were evacuated from our home and watched the hills burn around us, only to see those remarkable shoots of white against the deforested hills, I found that resurrection took on an additional meaning for me. The sight of the flowering yucca plant standing out against that scorched hillside enriched my understanding of something I had intellectualized but not felt. Death does not have the last word. Life asserts itself. Now, I know that my yucca plant and I do not determine the meaning of resurrection, but as a participant in a dynamic historical religion, I do contribute to it, even in the smallest of ways. That is, an historical approach to religion perceives and values its development over time through a dynamic process that involves the interaction of texts, communities, and lived experience. Applying the historical sensibility to the image of God, we can see how this central doctrine has accrued meaning over time. The historical approach considers the massiveness of the concept currently as a reflection of its development, as Christians have interacted with the concept across time and space. As a construing belief, the Imago Dei is informed by our experiences in the world, and particularly by our attention to bodies. We understand more fully the profound meaning of the image of God by truly attending to bodies in their destruction, brokenness, healing, restoration, and transformation. Moreover, the Abago Dei carries profound pastoral, political, and rhetorical power with which to speak to the violation of persons, to bear witness to the dignity being denied, and to call for the concern that is warranted. In both senses, this concept, with its handful of scriptural references, continues to interact with history unfolding, to accrue meaning, to shape interpretation, to guide action, to issue proclamation. The image of God is expansive and dynamic project of faith and history. In other words, the image of God is a dynamic concept that has accrued meaning over time, and that's okay, right? That's our first point. So what I want to invite you to think about with me as uh, really three places of generativity we could call them, three places where the image of God finds its political voice. The first is its usage in matters of social and economic justice, injustice. The second is its appearance in liberation movements and nonviolent resistance. And the third is in reference to moral injury. Now these places are um, sort of function as historical nodes in my mind, but they're not, it's not a timeline that I'm laying out. As I see it, they provide us a kind of tangibility. They are movements or moments when the image of God finds expression and also takes on new meaning. Are you guys with me? We okay? All right. <laughs> One storyline of the 20th century is a narrative about violation and assertion of personhood. 20th and 21st century. Exploitation of workers and the fights to end child labor and secure a living wage. I'm just gonna name a bunch of things and I want you to hear that kind of movement. Violation and assertion of personhood. The denial of political equality and the suffragette movement. The atrocities of the Shoah, the Holocaust, and the development of the UN Declaration of Human Rights lynching, Jim Crow, segregation, and the civil rights movement in the United States, 
apartheid and black consciousness, political repression, proxy wars, and the preferential option for the poor, systematic abuse and neglect of people with disabilities, and the witness of large communities. You have a sense of that kind of rhythm, right? In these examples, we see the way in which the Imago Dei undergirds language of rights. We also see the power of Imago Dei to affirm the inherent dignity of each and every person within structures that systematically deny personhood. For example, a more particular example, in response to the exploitation of workers and the use of child labor, the Federal Council of Churches drafted the 1908 Social Creed. It called on all churches to stand for equal rights and complete justice for all men in all stations of life, for safe working conditions and a living wage, for the abolition of child labor and the abatement of poverty. 100 years later, the National Council of Churches issued its social creed for the 21st century, kind of continuing that historical tradition, um, a document which by necessity really continued to appeal for safe working conditions, a living wage, and an end to child labor, poverty, and hunger. But unlike its predecessor, this document makes explicit the theological affirmations that undergird the language of rights. The full humanity, this is language from the document, the full humanity of each woman, man, and child, all created in the divine image as individuals of infinite worth. Now these documents constitute just a few pages of an historical record that reflects Christian attempts to illuminate gross inconsistency between human beings as created in the image of God and human beings as exploited in the economic machinery of society. In the rich tradition of Catholic social thought, the dignity of the human person mandates economic, social, and political rights, and also constitutes the criterion by which one judges uh, policies and practices. Building on papal statements since 1891, the US Catholic bishops issued economic justice for all in 1986, which includes a central theme uh, this assertion, every economic decision and institution must be judged in light of whether it protects or undermines the dignity of the human person. I mean, that's a remarkable criteria. <laughs> as this historical record demonstrates, the image of God serves as a Christian criterion for justice. Do the policies and practices of institutional life protect or undermine human dignity? Do they reflect or deny the image of God that gives all persons infinite worth? But the image of God is also more than a criterion for justice. It's a theological statement. Economic structures that assign people instrumental value rather than inherent value are not only unjust, they are sacrilegious. Economic policies that treat the poor as waste rather than recognizing infinite worth, are not only unfair, uh, unfair, they are a desecration of the holy, right? This theological power comes through. Archbishop Desmond Tutu made the same point when he denounced the violence of political repression in the context of apartheid South Africa. After insisting that human beings are endowed with dignity and worth, he wrote, to treat such persons as if they were less than this, to oppress them, to trample their dignity underfoot, is not just evil, as it surely must be. It is not just painful, as it frequently must be for the victims of injustice and oppression. It is positively blasphemous, for it is tantamount to spitting in the face of God. That's Tutu's language. Consider the power of that power of that language, particularly in contexts of systematic or systemic oppression and violence, contexts where persons are attacked, marginalized, and silenced because of an attribute that renders them less than. In these places, which of course are all around us, this universal theological affirmation of personhood is, in Tutu's words, 
marvelously exhilarating and staggering. We are all, each one of us, created in the image of God. This theological assertion, we are all, each one of us, created in the image of God, prophetically denounces perpetrators and systems of dehumanization, inspires resistance, and implicates bystanders near and far. In discourse and in action, this assertion has played a crucial role in resistance movements around the globe. In each movement, the universal assertion is applied to particular bodies that are devalued, neglected, or violated, a crucial move if it is to avoid becoming an empty platitude. Archbishop Tutu is one of many public theological voices who carried this theological claim into social and political spheres. From his context in apartheid South Africa, we can trace it running through black liberation theology more broadly, and we could do a similar tracing across liberation movements in Latin America, the United States, Europe, parts of Asia. In every context where Christianity has participated in the denial of personhood, we also find prophetic voices reminding us that the image of God is a universal affirmation. All are created in the image of God. In the context of racial violence, we hear prophetic voices insisting that the black body lying in the street is sacred and the destruction of that body is blasphemy. In the context of migration-related violence, we hear prophets standing outside of private detention centers insisting that the people who have no papers and no status are in fact bearers of the divine image. In the context of structural violence, we hear prophets proclaiming that those who are kicked to the curb because of addiction, poverty, untreated mental illness, are in fact God's beloved, in whom God is well pleased, right? Created in God's image. In the context of domestic violence, we hear prophets standing with a person whose body bears the scars of violence and insisting that that violence they have experienced is actually a desecration of the holy. Explicitly naming the devalued, violated, and neglected bodies is a theological act of remembering their sacredness and a political act of resisting violence and demanding respect. In the words of Palestinian Quaker Jean Zaru, resistance is the refusal to be neglected and disregarded. Through resistance, one demands to be seen and treated, or that another be seen and treated with dignity as one created in the image of God. Awareness of the image of God calls believers into conflict with systems and practices that treat people as less than. The dual awareness that all persons are created in the image of God, and yet we do not live that way, generates and sustains resistance, gives us that traction, right? Archbishop Tutu described the universal affirmation of personhood as marvelously exhilarating and also staggering. And I very much appreciate that word. We must surely stumble a bit when we recall that all persons are created in God's image, not only the oppressed, but also the oppressor, not only the victim, but also the perpetrator, not only the advocate for justice, but also the guardian and beneficiary of the status quo, the officer who shoots the unarmed man, the anti-immigrant protester who blocks the bus of unaccompanied minors and screams at them, the ruler who orchestrates the bombing of cities, the gunman who opens fire in a school, church, grocery store parking lot, the abuser, the terrorist, each and every one of them is also created in the image of God. And that is a staggering assertion. Now I alerted you to this point in my introduction when I named the three points I wanted to convey. This is the second one. The image of God is a powerful political claim. 
and that warrants attention and care. To insist that all are created in the image of God is both a powerful affirmation of value and an arresting claim about accountability. It has political meaning and political implications to say that all are created in the image of God, all have value, all have the possibility for redemption. And now I wanna push this just one more step. One further development in interpretations of the image of God is not only to affirm individual value, but to affirm relationship. To not only insist that all people are made in the image of God like I am, but that all are made in the image of God with me. Do you feel the difference in that? Now, I need to pause for a minute to say something distinctly Wesleyan. <laughs> I've referenced Catholics and Anglicans and Quakers so far, but the tradition that formed me, Methodism, has shaped the way I understand the image of God in relational terms. And since I know there are some Methodists in the audience, I wanna make sure to make this influence plain. So some of you may know Ted Runyon. We talked about Ted Runyon a little bit last night and his book, The New Creation from 1998. In this important book, Runyon described the theology beneath Methodist social witness in the areas of human rights, the environment, and poverty. He highlighted a soteriology, theology of salvation, that sees the great salvation as nothing less than a new creation transforming all dimensions of human existence, both personal and social. Central to this is a particular understanding of the image of God, which reinforces relationality. Professor Runyon explained that Wesley understood, and this is his language, the image of God more relationally, not so much as something humans possess, as the way they are related to God and live out that relation in the world. Wesley described three ways that human beings bear the image of God. The natural image refers to the endowments that make us capable of God or able to enter into relationship with God. These include understanding, will, and freedom. Recognizing that the natural image echoes more traditional and problematic language of capabilities, Runyon argues that even here, we see that the qualities of the natural image are in the service of relationship. Wesley understood the political image to capture the place of human beings in governing the earth. Human beings are assigned a place of privilege and responsibility. But again, this place is nested in a context of relationship to the creator of all things. Runyon explains, humanity is the image of God insofar as the benevolence of God is reflected in human action toward the rest of creation. I'll just say that one again. Humanity is the image of God insofar as the benevolence of God is reflected in human action toward the rest of creation. In the moral image of God, the human being receives continually from the creator and mediates to the world that which is received. This is the context of Wesley's proposal for spiritual respiration, the ongoing breathing in of the spirit of God and the channeling of that spirit out into the world. This unceasing presence of God understores our relationship with the creator a relationship that we maintain through a life of service to God, our fellow beings, and all creation. So our relationship to the creator locks us into relationship with one another. The image of God is not only a declaration of personhood, it is a declaration of relationship. And this means that the concept, if lived out, if taken seriously, if allowed to shape our behavior, not only grounds human rights, for example, but it also establishes the context for our relationships and our responsibilities to one another. Again, we see this kind of awareness in writings and work uh, from Jean Zaru, who reminds us that, and this is her language, my enemy too is a child of God. 
In the context of Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, Zaru re resists nonviolence, sorry, resists nonviolently because she perceives the quality that Quakers refer to as that of God in the person's suffering and in the person's perpetuating multiple forms of violence. The affirmation of the image of God inspires re resistance and also shapes it. The form of resistance must continue to recognize that of God in the other, even if it is the enemy other, right? Respecting the humanity of the other or continuing to love the enemy is a core commitment that shapes the actions of nonviolent resistors. We see this concretely in historical documents from the civil rights movement, which included commitment cards and codes of conduct calling on participants to walk and talk in the manner of love, to refrain from violence of fist, tongue, and heart. Zaru articulates a commitment that is core to nonviolent resistance by saying that the means and ends should be consistent. One cannot create socially just institutions that safeguard and respect personhood through efforts that violate personhood. This commitment to the image of God sustains a paradox then. It calls one into conflict with societal forces that violate the person, and it calls one to treat the violator as fully human. The image of God, when taken seriously, muddies our lives, our politics, and our speech. It does not allow us to divide the world neatly between good guys and bad guys. It binds us to people we might rather get away from. If one takes the Imago Dei seriously, one cannot dismiss anyone as unworthy of care or beyond redemption. In this sense, the image of God is a Christian's greatest affirmation and also our most challenging truth. So let me just pause and do a little recap here and kind of get you guys I'm energized. I've been talking a lot. So where are we with our reflections, right? We've talked about the image of God accruing meaning over time, that Christians both interpret their experience in light of this conviction and also come to understand the convictions differently in light of experience. We've also talked about the political power of the image of God how it grounds resistance and also sets some parameters for what form that resistance should take. In this last part of the talk, I want to say something about the relationship between the image of God and experiences of violence. It's a little bit different. So far, we've talked more about the image of God as a kind of anchor point from which to make a political assertion about rights and relationships, claims of affirmation and accountability. But I want to invite you also to think about the way in which the image of God is impacted by lived experiences of violence. So that's our last sort of move. One of many things that I've learned through studying violence is that an act of violence is never an isolated event, but rather always part of a larger story. There are narratives of violence rather than an act of violence. Right? Similarly, the violation or denial of the image of God is not an isolated or encapsulated event, but rather violation and denial are always part of this larger story. The image of God may be violated in a moment, but it is diminished over time through repetition of abuse systemic discrimination, or a never-ending barrage of humiliation and ridicule. We see the ways in which the Imago Dei gets buried underneath acts of abuse, patterns of neglect, and speech that belittles and betrays. Moreover, we see that this burial occurs in the life of those inflicting violence, as well as those receiving it. The literature on moral injury provides a resource for understanding the effect of participation in violence over time. So this is another one's kind of interactions. We have a concept of the Imago Dei, and we have this emerging literature around moral injury, and they inform one another, right? So you see something differently because of 
uh, these experiences of soldiers and this, the way psychologists describe them. So psychologists and veterans use the term moral injury to describe a wound experienced by soldiers when a trusted authority orders them to act in ways contrary to conscience. Jonathan Shea, a psychologist who worked with Vietnam veterans, identifies three elements of moral injury, betrayal, legitimate authority, and a situation of great weight. It's a complex dynamic involving personal wrongdoing and also a lack of autonomy, a sense of duty, and also a feeling of betrayal. As Iraq veteran Tyler Boudreau makes clear, however, the depth of moral injury does not necessarily correspond with the intensity of violence in which one participated. In his experience, moral injury occurs through ongoing participation in the low-level violence of occupation, during which soldiers repeatedly perform actions that transgress their sense of morality. He writes, what I found most difficult for people to grasp is the full range of moral injuries that sustain, sustained in Iraq, because it's not always about the killing. Boudreau describes being with veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan as they, and this is his language, described the daily grind of driving in and out of towns, patrolling through streets, searching houses, detaining suspected insurgents, questioning locals, and all the while trying to stay alive. Boudreaux's point is powerfully illustrated in a narrative by another veteran named Michael Yandel, with whom I've worked at Emory. Also a veteran of the Iraq War, Yandel tells the story of offering a bottle of water to a young Iraqi boy who had asked for candy. When the boy refuses the water, Yandel becomes angry. He writes, I rip the cap off the liter bottle in my hand, dump some of it out on the ground, and throw it at the kid. An old man, most likely his grandfather, rushes up, grabs the boy, and pulls him away. The old man looks at me, Yandel writes, not with anger, hate, or even sadness. His eyes are full of fear. He's afraid of me. In that moment, I don't recognize that look because I don't recognize myself. How can he be afraid of me? I'm one of the good guys after all. Yando will never forget the way that the Iraqi man looked at him, nor will he ever forget that feeling of losing himself, not recognizing the person he had become. Like Boudreaux, Yando felt that his moral center had eroded over time through participation in a system that repeatedly demanded his transgression of moral boundaries momentous and minor every day. It's significant to just note the way that moral injury is finding its way into other spheres of work. Healthcare workers are talking about experiences of moral injury, right? It's a, it's a powerful concept that I think people are wrestling with in all uh, different kinds of work, labor. Those who participate in violence, whether morally justified or not, are also obviously created in the image of God. They do not forfeit human dignity when they participate in violence, and yet the experiences of veterans suffering moral injury illustrate the ways in which a, a perpetrator of violence or a participant in ongoing systems of structural violence loses their moral center and comes to feel that they have transformed into someone else perhaps feeling unworthy of love and care. Much as years of abuse and neglect diminish the sense of self, participation in actions contrary to one's sense of morality diminish one's identity as created in the image of God. One of the most powerful features of the narratives of moral injury that veterans are now courageous enough to share is that moral injury accrues over time. It is not so much the result of one dramatic event, but the erosion of one's moral fiber over time as one participates in a system that is both demanding and totalizing. If violation of the image of God is not an act, but a process, the same thing must be said of restoration or recovery of the image of God. 
This too is a process, a narrative of healing or restoration. It's a process of restoring, remembering really, I think, that which we were created to be. This process is a social process. It involves an interactional dynamic. One is not only created in God's image, but is also called to recognize the image of God in others and reflect God's image in the world. Recognizing and reflecting the image of God in the world is one way to describe the ongoing work of religious peace building. So what does all of this mean for our responsibilities in contexts of violence, kind of our main question for the afternoon? For Christians, the image of God establishes parameters for our treatment of people. Whether violence is physical, structural, psychological, or spiritual, someone who takes the image of God seriously must denounce and resist it. In the language of the Catholic social tradition, the image of God sets an ethical criterion for treatment of others. In traditional liberal political language, it grounds a commitment to rights. It draws the lines around what may and may not be done in pursuit of a goal. But I've also tried to suggest that the image of God does more than ground individual rights. It draws us into relationship with one another. I am created in the image of God just as you all are, and also we are created in the image of God together. This conviction binds us together such that I am accountable to you and you to me. Lastly, Christians who take the image of God seriously must also take seriously the impact of experiences of violence on the self, the person we are becoming, the person we are meant to be, Victims and perpetrators alike are created in the image of God, absolutely. And also, violence has the power to bury that image in disregard and shame. In contexts of violence, we have a responsibility to uncover that image. And this is ongoing and social work. The work of recognizing, remembering, responding to, and reflecting the image of God can only be done through social interaction and collaborative work for peace and justice. So let me end where I began. This is shared work demanding collaborative response. Everyone here has a role to play in understanding violence, resisting it, and repairing the harm it does. From our various disciplines of knowledge and our various vocational paths, we have something to offer to the task. And I thank you for your attention to this offering of mine and look forward to some conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a lot to think about. And we'll take a few moments uh, for a break. We'll reconvene at 2 o'clock and welcome our panelists at that time. It's about eight minutes, eight minute break. <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs>
So tell you what. We'll start here and go this way. Good afternoon and welcome back, everyone. I am James Boley, and I am pleased as a representative of the Religious Studies Department to join with the chaplain's office in putting together this T.W. Lewis and Lee Reif event, Summer's Lecture. Uh, of course, the chaplain's office, I will be first to admit, did most of the work, and I appreciate that very much, Joey and others as well. And I am very pleased to be in the presence of T.W. Lewis, uh, who has, whose spirit has graced this campus since 1959. And I love to think of these events as continuing that spirit in many, many ways. We are, of course, very grateful to Ellen Ott Marshall for that fine presentation and all of her learning that she brings to us and is sharing with us. And we want to respond in a way that is thoughtful and in a way that uh, brings even more insight, perhaps. And one of the ways I thought of doing that was bringing people from our fine faculty to this discussion to talk about ethics, especially from other perspectives. So I am very pleased to introduce three of our finest faculty from philosophy, psychology, and sociology. So first of all, Luanda Evans uh, has been here at Millsap since 2012, and she is a associate professor of sociology. And when she first came, I thought that the courses she taught had very interesting titles, and then students started talking about her courses. And I knew it went far beyond titles because she teaches things like many dimensions of poverty and crime and prisons. And these are courses that I, that I know have changed lives of students and that students have raved about in all the best ways that one would want a student to rave about a course. And that does not mean it's easy. They often said it was really hard, but really good. Secondly, Patrick Hopkins, who has been at Millsap since the year 2000, and he is the Jenny Carlisle Golding Professor of Philosophy. He also has two appointments at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, and also faculty at the Center of Bioethics and Medical Humanities. I have taught with Patrick many times in Heritage and know of his courses in philosophy very well. And he teaches more courses on ethics and fill in the blank than anyone else, whether it's uh, medicine or business and many other things. Thirdly, Professor Kurt Thaw has been here since 1998. He is professor of philosophy and he earned his PhD as at Florida State, which makes him the second most famous Jacksonite from Florida State, a little bit behind Deion Sanders, okay? But he is far more important. And uh, he has taught many courses, and again, many students have raved about his courses. And you know from courses like Love and Sexuality, Fear and Terrorism, that these are courses that deal with ethics on the psychological level every single day. So, first of all, won't you please welcome with me our fine panelists. And what we will do is start on the far end with Kurt Thaw, and each one will say, will speak for five or ten minutes in a response, and then uh, Ellen will come back and uh, respond to theirs and really start a conversation between them and hopefully among us as well. So please, start us off, then it will, uh, Kurt, and then it will be Patrick, and then it will be Lou. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, James, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting us here to join today. Um, from, um, from a psychological perspective and, and thinking about some of the, the topics today, I think most people would agree that having uh, a framework with which to um, place your own values, your own ideas, even your own definitions about something like uh, 
peace building, fairness, um, uh, your ideologies, your religious beliefs is, is comforting. Uh, we, we don't like to think we are the only ones who think a certain way. And so one thing I would like to start is just by saying that it's, it's really wonderful when we have a framework with which to work in. Um, it doesn't mean we have to agree with all of the, the, uh, the scaffolding that makes up that framework, but it really, as humans, it makes it easier for us to then begin talking about things, even really controversial, difficult to talk about things. Um, so uh, starting with that, uh, I want to uh, shift real quickly to sort of the end of, uh, of, the, of the talk, dealing with, uh, and I'm, make sure I get the term right, moral uh, just Moral injury. Uh, moral injury um, actually comes from an extension of another area of psychology known as cognitive dissonance, whereby when you're, when you're either doing something or you've agreed to do something and you realize at some point maybe this isn't what you really believe or you're not doing it the way you think you should do it, we often have to make some sort of choice. We can either say, we're not gonna do this anymore, or we can find a way to justify why we're doing this thing that we don't necessarily believe in. And the moral injury part of this is sort of like having an, a really extended period of time where you're dealing with cognitive dissonance. And that, that makes it to me, I, you mentioned the word harm, and I, I think it really does do harm because what cognitive dissonance tries to do is tries to give you a way to not feel so bad about what you're doing, to justify what you're doing, to, to to not think you're the bad guy. But when you're exposed to this sort of extended period of time where people are maybe dependent on you to do this because of their safety or because it's your job, uh, you're in the military or something, this can probably lead to some uh, conditions far more difficult to treat than, I'm, I'm gonna say just PTSD, I know that's really difficult to treat, but I mean something much that becomes much more deeply embedded into one's psyche. And I think, again, having a framework with which to understand that is probably gonna be the first step in really helping uh, veterans in particular deal with some of these really challenging issues that they have about how they're treating other people and their sort of role in society and especially if they you know, are also you know, thinking about themselves as being a religious person and acting in the, the image of God. They're, they're gonna really be conflicted with this. So I think this is a really, a uh, nice way to begin finding ways to help uh, folks in that situation. And I will pass uh, the baton on to uh, my comrade. Well, thank you very much for the talk. It's very um, thought provoking. Uh, so I teach ethics and I teach moral psychology. And so I was uh, struck, I think, of course, I know this is just one talk, and, and, and you may have covered everything I'm about to uh, ask about in many of your other works. But I was struck by how um, focused the, the notion of our ethical relationships to other people and the notion of what it means to be in the image of God was focused on the rights of other people. And except for a couple of times when you use the term accountability, there was uh, very little sense of, uh, of everyone's responsibility. And so part of our moral psychological makeup is very much about us holding other people responsible. And so partly, while I think that it, it makes great sense to refer to the um, Imago Dei, I think, and I don't know the Latin for this, but we, we also have to refer to the imago social primate. So, um, so when I think about uh, moral psychology, <laughs> okay, yeah, what is it? What is it? Simei. Simei, imago simei. Okay, okay, imago. <laughs> okay, that works, that works. So um, when I think about the empirical research in moral psychology, there is, of course, a lot that is done on notions of acceptance and love and help and care and nurturing, but absolutely equally to human nature, this is built in, we would not be what we are without this, are the concepts of blame and accusation and judgment and punishment and prediction. And all of this largely, I think, comes from 
our background as social primates where we are fundamentally social, we are fundamentally in relationships, and we are fundamentally trying to predict what our interactions with other people will be. So I was thinking, and this is not meant at all to be an accusation or anything, but I was thinking in some ways that there's another type of dehumanization that can occur. It is true that when we ignore the, the nature of human beings that we, we get from the uh, idea of the image of God, that we're ignoring their dignity and their personhood, and when we, when we don't respect them, and when we harm them, and we treat them as if they uh, have no value. All of that is definitely dehumanizing. But I think in terms of the moral psychology of humans, it's, it's also dehumanizing to treat people as if they don't have responsibility. Part of the, the notion, uh, at least a, a, a classical traditional notion of the image of God is that part of that is that we are rational, we have free will, and we have agency. And so part of treating other people as humans is to treat them as agents. And that means that to respect them, to respect their dignity, we must treat them as people who are responsible for their choices, responsible for their actions, and thus punishment is a way to respect and, and to dignify people. If we, if we only act and think as if um, other people are patients and we have to help them and care for them and respect them and not agents, then we treat them as infants or animals or robots. And while that may not be a type of moral injury, I think that would be a type of moral negligence Part of the idea of the Imago Dei is that we are in, created in the image of God, but that's not the same thing as God. God does not need, in traditional theology, to grow, to change, to be morally educated, to, um, to learn how to be in healthy relationships, right? But we do, and if we only think of and I'm not saying you do this, but if we tend mostly to think that our relationship and our ethical relationship to other people is one of taking care, then we turn people just into patients and not agents. And that strikes me as also a type of dehumanization and not attending to the dignity of the human being. That's gonna be pretty hard to follow up. <laughs> so I'll say, um, as a sociologist, I left this reading with more questions. That's what I do ask any of my students. It's like, when are you going to stop asking all these questions? The how, the why, the when, the where. But there are several big things that you talked about in this piece that were really significant to some of the things that I do. Um, and I think it transitions, as you mentioned, very well and very nicely into my discipline. So we won't talk about the image of God much in sociology courses, but we do talk about many of these other concepts that you mentioned, like structural violence and the significance of talking about it. Um, and I was really struck by how you use the idea of structural violence because it is about the body and the dehumanization of the body in a variety of ways, in very um, open, uh, overt ways, but also in very covert ways, like you mentioned. Um, and, you know, I can think about this, and we talk about it a lot in my courses, especially on poverty and what that means in terms of structural violence, but how also that violence, um, economic violence, becomes structural violence because it is against bodies and there are consequences. We talk about it as well in my health and illness class and how people don't have access to adequate health care, good health care. We talk about structural violence in my courses right now with what's happening with Jackson and Water. That is an inherently violent act. And so for me in some ways, uh, reading about the image of God was very ideological to me. It sounds great, but at the same time I start having these questions, whose ethics? Who, who makes the ethics? How is that information disseminated? How are some of these ethical understandings also structurally violent um, when, when I think about them? 
And I also think about this from the perspective of being um, a woman of color. So there was a lot in your piece that really struck me as incredibly meaningful, that as well as notions of moral injury. My, one of my questions was, we talk about moral injury from the perspective of folks that are kind of giving, but what about moral injury for the folks that receive it, um, that are consistently injured in some way, and how that then can shape life outcomes via notions of trauma, right? I mean, we don't think about it, and we can think about um, the trauma that results from consistently experiencing violence. And I thought about that example that Mr. Boudreaux included about um, the boy being afraid of the soldier. It's sort of, I immediately thought about blacks and the police. Even if you know that you've done nothing wrong, that has been such a systemic kind of issue, there is this immediate fear that people experience, and the outcome is folks will say, if you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't be afraid. No, but it's now become part of this collective trauma. The flip side of that is that we have collective forgive, or yeah, collective forgetting from people that are actually perpetrating these kinds of acts. And so one thing that I was thinking about in terms of we have to see all parties with the image of God, I wonder if we also need to leave some room for justified anger because of collective forgetting. And in sociology, my discipline's really going through it right now, and even as a critical race scholar, I don't know if I should say that out loud, um, but we have to be mindful of erasure, and that's what I'm talking about in terms of collective forgetting. Let me forget what we've done as perpetrators of this violence. Let us not talk about what we do um, in terms of structural violence. Let's just let it go. And so I love the idea of um, looking at or examining things through this particular frame framework. I think it's a start. but. Um, I also think about, um, like I said, this kind of idea of justified anger and collective forgetting or collective erasure. So, yeah, I don't know. There was a lot in here. I can keep going, but I'll stop here so that we can kind of engage in some dialogue and ask some questions. sitting at a table with you. Thank, thank you so, oh no, it's okay, I'll, yeah. Thank you so much, I appreciate your um, good challenging questions and uh, I mean there's a, um, these are hard to respond to and I still appreciate them. The, the good critical question is also one when you know you've been listened to and someone's really wrestling with what you've said and I appreciate that very much. Um, I want to say just as a general kind of comment too, I, when I saw your fields, um, uh, I was so happy because one of the traditional definitions of peace and conflict studies is that you, um, it's this study of the underlying causes of violence and the means and conditions for peace. And so it's an, an intrinsically interdisciplinary field. You have to draw on the resources of philosophy and psychology and sociology and political science and economics and, um, to understand all of this. So I'm really, I'm really grateful for this. And I'm challenged too. Um, by your points very much. I think the, the, the comment about cognitive dissonance is really helpful to me. I wasn't aware of that connection in your discipline and that sort of gives a kind of uh, depth to the newer literature on moral injury. That's, that's very helpful. I think also your opening comment about having a framework in which to sort of tackle these questions and interpret the world and I think part of what um, we're constantly trying to do as teachers is to help students perceive maybe the framework that they don't know is there. Kind of, I don't know if this is appropriate to the way you'd use that word, but I know certainly in a theological school we spend a lot of time talking about the embedded theology is that they bring into the classroom and kind of let's make that visible and think about how that is framing the way that you interpret the world and respond to it. And that was very helpful. Um, yeah, Patrick's really pressing me on uh, a doctrine of sin would be one way, I think, to think about that, right? How do you... So, um, so let me just say a couple of things. I hope that what I conveyed is that the conviction, the affirmation of the image of God in every person 
is not a kind of Pollyanna look at the world um, that everybody's great and nobody actually does anything wrong and if they did do something wrong they didn't mean to. And that's not at all what I would hope to convey. I mean the, the power of the Imago Dei is that you are, this is Brian Stevenson's language, right? You're, you're more than your worst act. I mean your actions do not define the being that you are and I think that distinction um, theologically and ethically uh, for me is, is very important. Um, I think the, um, one of those sort of uh, trajectories out of this conversation about Imago Dei and violence is to think about the work of restorative justice, which absolutely takes seriously wrongdoing and holding people accountable for what they've done. It also understands that that work of accountability, the consequences, the punishment, the discipline has got to be connected with an assessment of harm and a listening to the, the, the one harmed, right? So the ongoing work of trying to bring into conversation um, the, the, perpetu the perpetrator and the victim of violence so that the perpetrator can actually hear the harm that's been done. So that's a, I think that's a, a format for consequences <laughs> um, that is still taking this relational uh, notion of Imago Dei seriously. Um, yeah, um, Lou, my goodness. Okay, so again, really helpful concepts that I appreciate. Yes, yes, yes on uh, sociologists and structural violence, particularly given the courses that you're teaching. Um, I, think, I think of um, ethics as such a parasitic discipline. It's always sort of drawing off of all of the others. And, and for ethicists who take uh, structures seriously, sociologists who can kind of map that and capture it uh, in data and help us understand the data, that's been crucial. Um, I appreciate also that particularly the challenge about anger. Um, and I think I would say a similar thing back, I would hope that in the language about Imago Dei, um, image of God is not kind of platitude reassuring language, but it also has a kind of fire to it. So I, I, I think of it and I hear it and these kind of contemporary prophets who are thoroughly denouncing these forms of both physical and structural violence and bringing a righteous indignation to them. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'm so glad you raised that, that's crucial. Um, and the language of collective forgetting also is, I think, a similar, I mean, I hear that as a little bit connected to Patrick's concern um, about a kind of rosy um, theological anthropology, a really happy view of human beings that also lets us sort of move a little too quickly past egregious wrongdoing. And so I appreciate, again, the reminder to come back and sit thoroughly um, with uh, the wrong that's been done and the, uh, the rage um, and the anger that is a part of all these experiences of harm. Um, can I ask you guys a question? Back. So one of the things I was excited about in this panel is to sort of understand how from your disciplines and your classes uh, you help students to reckon with violence in the world. And so can I just ask you to talk about that a little bit? What, what forms of violence do you talk about in your classes? How do you help your students engage those forms of violence? Cool. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start, but honestly, um, we don't touch on, on violence as often as, as maybe we should in uh, some of our psychology classes because there is, you know, high probability you'll be at some point uh, have, having to have some exposure to it, either directly or indirectly through, through family members and friends. Um, you know, psychology traditionally focuses on human behavior, and in that sense, we do put a lot of the responsibility of individuals' actions on that individual. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sort of in the, in, under, under this uh, sort of umbrella topic of how we discuss violence, we, we do sort of uh, look at it in terms of decision making and, you know, uh, maybe return on investment. Um, you know, why are you doing that behavior even though it maybe was unethical or immoral? Um, in, in our uh, classes on 
learning, we are really focused on the fact that we are so much, sometimes not even aware, but so much guided by the idea of getting reinforcement and avoiding punishment. Um, and so we will perpetuate violence to, to avoid getting punished. Uh, we'll perpetuate violence to get some reward, but it is not the appropriate type of behavior in a, uh, a society of other humans, especially under the, um, this idea of considering it you know, in the image of God. We certainly shouldn't treat each other that way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we really put a lot more emphasis on individual responsibility for behavior, good or bad. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so in my courses, we talk about violence in several different ways. Um, and I'm thinking particularly in my Dimensions of Poverty course and my Crime and Prisons course, the best way that I can teach students and have them start to grapple with notions of violence is to get them on the ground, to get them out into the community to be able to see what it's like. I can tell them that poverty is violent, mm -hmm. um, but what would that mean to them? So what we do is we partner with uh, you know, folks in the community so that they can see what it looks like, unfortunately, just kind of right there in your face. And then they have to kind of grapple with that to think about how poverty in and of itself is also an extreme form of violence, how people are unhealthy, how people are homeless, how people don't have food, um, those sorts of things. And then we talk about it in a very structural way in that we have to be careful with structural violence because it takes on this mind of naturalization and though people, we then justify with people, why people are where they are as though it's their natural position to be in that position. Mm -hmm. So it's important for them to see that. The same thing with crime and prisons. Yes, unfortunately, I take my students to prisons, um, but I think it's a way because people have this misconception that, well, they've done something incredibly wrong, they deserve to be where they are, but I take them to see that prison is not what you see on TV. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's traumatic to visit a, a prison. It's traumatic for them to be, um, you know, faced with the lethal injection table and to, to know what it's like to actually experience that. Um, and so, again, we talk about violence. We also talk about inequality in punishment and incarceration and things like that. That's also um, a form of violence. So I teach about violence in lots of different ways, and I have to say that most students leave my courses. I had one student this last semester that said, the semester's over and I have more questions than I came in with. Yeah. Well, that's what I want. Yeah. yeah. Because you know, it's important for them to continue to explore the differences in the ways that things can happen that are violent, and how we, um, in many ways, can actually engage in that as, as well, in that process as well. Um, and so none of us are off the hook yeah. with ways that we engage in violence. So that's kind of some of the ways that I mm -hmm. have them look at it. Great. Thank you. Well, I would say in my, in my classes, when <laughs> I, I do philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, moral psychology, as well as a lot of applied ethics. Mm -hmm. So in, on one hand, particularly in the empirical moral psychology, uh, we recognize that violence is not unnatural mm -hmm. for human beings. Um, it is, it is not desirable, just because something is natural does not mean it's all desirable, mm -hmm. but there are lots of ways in which uh, psychology, um, the moral psychology can demonstrate the types of things that are likely lead, would likely lead to violent responses, mm -hmm. and part of our evolutionary history explains some of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I would say, though, is that in terms of uh, violence, uh, particularly in uh, political philosophy and stuff, we're much more critical, I think, of using the word violence for everything. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, and this happens in, in medical ethics too, when you describe something as a public health problem, as opposed to a moral problem or some other kind of problem, then that transfers it over into the power of the state. Because the, the most typical kind of uh, restriction on the state in a liberal democracy is you can interfere with someone's actions if they're going to harm someone else. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not harming someone else, then live and let live. Mm -hmm. And so the more things that are referred to as a public health problem or as violence 
gives greater and greater extent to the state to respond to that with state authority. So if you describe um, language as violence, so that if someone uh, says something to you that bothers you and you describe that as violence, mm -hmm. then that, mean is, that means it is appropriate for the state to prevent that from happening in the same way that it would be appropriate for the state to prevent you from stabbing someone. So um, I think that sometimes uh, academics uh, will use language that is um, a little more florid than perhaps um, it should be because they're trying to emphasize that this area that I'm talking about is really important. Mm -hmm. But um, in philosophy, we're, we pay a lot of attention to defining our terms and distinguishing these, these things, right? Mm -hmm. And so if virtually everything counts as a type of violence, then we're gonna have to have another word for physical assault mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because um, that is the kind of thing that um, generates a, a different kind of response. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, go, go, Lou, jump in. I'm interrupting the speaker, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. No, but Patrick, I was wondering if you can expand on that just a little bit about just defining things as violent and allowing the state to enter. If we don't look at something, for instance, public health problems as violent, are we looking at it at a very individualistic level to say, well, then this person is violent, not the system itself? Does that make sense? Well, it depends on you know, what you're describing as violence. But you know, if, if, for example, if you describe offensive language as violence, then it's utterly appropriate for the state to prevent you from you know, saying certain kinds of things. It's also the case that um, when we think of violence, there's, there usually needs to be uh, an actor to which we can attribute the decision to be violent and the act of being violent. And in some cases, um, the something that is a bad thing is a bad thing, but it's not violence. I mean, if, um, if someone is poor and they had had all of their, uh, their possessions stripped from them, then that might be a violent way that they became poor. But just because they're poor doesn't mean that they're that way because of violence. It may be an economic system, it may be uh, a social system, it may be a value system. There are a number of different ways that that could occur. But the sheer existence of poverty, calling that violence, I'm, I'm not sure what that, would, what that would mean. Boy, I just disagree with you on so many things. This is great. <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting, I was smiling when you were talking because you're going to hate this, but there's a, a peace studies scholar named Johann Galtung who describes violence as anything that inhibits a person's flourishing. Right, I mean, that's that super capacious. And, and everyone in here right now is being violent and should be stopped because there are things we could be doing to help people flourishing. You know? yeah. So it, yeah. it's sort of like, you know, if, if, if everything is X, then what good do we get from using the term X? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder, yeah. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, and I'm going to get the passage wrong, but um, you, you quoted uh, some line of scripture that said, you know, if you shed human blood, you should be prepared to also have your blood shed. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile that with your idea of in the image of God where you're, you're saying, oh, we shouldn't do that, yet mm -hmm. it's in the Bible saying that get ready for it because you earned it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you're asking me a, a big question about my understanding of the authority of Scripture, too, and, and how I uh, work with Scripture. I, um, I am not a biblical literalist, uh, for one thing. Um, so <laughs> there are many, many, many uh, things in Scripture that I uh, do not agree with and would not condone. Um, so I, that's sort of the first thing I would say um, back. I think that... Um, a second thing is that there would be people who, I mean, I am a pacifist, so your question is fair to me, but there would certainly be people who 
um, affirm a strong understanding of the Mago Dei and still understand the, uh, believe that there are conditions in which violence is morally justified. So I wouldn't want to conflate sort of what I've been describing about the image of God with a pacifist position. Um, for me, part of the reason why I am pacifist is because of the Imago Dei, because I think violence against a person is a, is a um, yeah, a, a violence against a sacred uh, life. So um, that also means that for me, I have a lot of wrestling around how we behave responsibly in such a violent world. So it's not that I'm pacifist without ambiguity, I'm riddled with it. <laughs> Lots of ways, yeah. <laughs> Um, I feel like we should, how do you want to do this, moderator? Do you want to open things sure. up a little bit? Or? So let's go ahead okay. and open it up. If other people have questions to ask any of the panelists or our speaker, please, go ahead. When you talk about an act of violence is an error to the completion, I was just thinking about uh, a family uh, and we, we look at the structures in the culture and academics, church, and when we run in, when I run into things, it's so often about a family system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, in the image of God, we begin as this infant that is in the image of God, and almost immediately there are things that are piled on to that, or regardless of our intention. And uh, just the, the power of a family system uh, in terms of making structural difference is, uh, in my experience, has been good. And, and it can be a powerful thing. And also, uh, in terms of punishment, I was thinking about a, a legal term of depraved indifference where we just don't care enough to, to do what's right or responsible, even though we might be aware of that. Uh, but I was just thinking about the place in, in your ethic of, uh, because I've seen these shifts in generations in, in my own family that's going into a different place and it's leaving behind so many things of the old, uh, and to me that's a, a powerful movement uh, that's even closer than the church. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think I, that's an incredibly important uh, comment, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, so much of what we've been talking about are these sort of large societal forces, and so to think about our the, the family system, or even um, more just the, the, the intimacy uh, of family structures and the ways in which we are formed through those. Uh, I think that's an incredibly important point. So I hope I understood you. I think that was great. Thank you. We have a question. Yeah, uh, love the concept, we're all created in the image of God, essential dignity and worth. That's a wonderful place to start a dialogue in academia with conservative theologians or others who may not necessarily agree, but will accept the paradigm for the sake of exploring all the logical and perhaps illogical conclusions. It appears to me the biggest problem though we have is as with lay people outside the academy who are hate mongers who, to use your term, <coughs> depraved indifference. It's not necessarily indifference, it's uh, depraved denial denial that there is dignity in every human and that we see examples of the rhetoric of politicians who appeal to xenophobia, uh, homophobia, misogyny as ways to advance their causes and by definition these people aren't acknowledging, accepting your fundamental premise. So not everyone's a theologian, and most of the actors in this world that are responsible for your being here and talking about conflict resolution uh, probably don't accept the 
fundamental premise that we're all, or at least the outward appearance is they don't accept the fundamental premise that we're all created in the image of God. So if we can't start there, how do we, I mean, maybe you're going to address this tomorrow and I'm looking forward to hearing it, but it seems to me that it's a, it's a very difficult situation where the purveyors of this hate speech don't really buy your fundamental premise. Yeah, well, um, I don't think if I were trying to ad address, um, let's see, how do I want to say this? Um, yeah, so I think confronted, so drop all the sort of conceptual work and the theological work and the biblical references, and let me tell you this history. Um, whether or not I could convince a hate monger that they and the people that they hate are all created in the God and I am, uh, created in the image of God and I am too, I will still believe that. And I will live that way and I will assert that. So I think that's kind of an important baseline, right? There is the kind of pragmatic, how are we going to change things that are happening out there that work? And the pragmatic questions, the how questions, are important. But beneath them, there are convictions that we hold, whether or not they have the pragmatic impact that one would hope. So if I can't change their minds, I'm still going to believe that they're created in the image of God, and so am I, and so is everybody that they hate. Like, that does not change one bit of this conviction. Um, I think the other thing that's important, too, is that there are many ways in which to translate, in which this concept is translated into pluralistic spaces. And so there might be people who could hear language of dignity, probably not language of rights, that would be too triggering of other things as well, but dignity might be a kind of concept to get some leverage there. But I, the, the, I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, sort of push against pragmatism. There's a reason why I work on conflict. I do want things to get better. But I also think that they, there are these convictions that just endure while we're doing the ongoing labor of trying to break through systems that don't change. Question here. So, um, hi, yes. So I appreciated um, your response about um, Galtung. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering if you could say some more about, because I, I also disagree with narrowing the concept of violence to requiring an agent. And, um, and I was, you know, so Galtung has, to me, been important because of his concept of structural violence. Yeah. Um, you know, and one way I think about that is, you know, even if, you know, during maybe, night, you know, a certain day or month in 19... 40 in the United States, there didn't happen to be anybody punch somebody mm -hmm. or shoot anybody or hang anybody. And there didn't happen to be, well, of course, we were at that point, I guess, involved in, well, no, I guess, in, in any case, if that was not happening for that month, it doesn't mean to me that there was peace or mm -hmm. positive peace there was still there were all kinds of structural violences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, anyways I was wondering if you would have anything to add or comment there. yeah yeah oh that's great yeah I mean yes to all of that yeah part of what Galton was trying to um, articulate is exactly what you said a, a move from a negative definition of peace as the absence of violence to this more complicated notion of peace is also addressing these forms of structural violence and other things that are impinging on a person's uh, flourishment. And the other thing that's also related to that is that um, this uh, sort of perspective of looking at our society never as a kind of stable peace or a, um, a stable conflict, stable violence, but that there are always um, in a given space and time multiple uh, forms of violence and peace in that one sort of shared space. So it just opens up a much more complicated way, yeah, to look at a certain uh, space and time. Yeah. Oh, and I just wanted to say, so for instance, I said 1940 because of course in the United States that's in the South we have Jim Crow. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. Yeah. I have a question about the siblinghood of humanity, mm -hmm. aka brotherhood of man. Mm -hmm. um, Check me on this. 
uh, but um, I think in biblical language, the image and likeness phrasing applies to parent-child um, procreation. You know, the, the, the child is in the image and likeness of the parent, and this might be a way to sort of solemnize uh, the successor to a king or, or a patriarch. Uh, but anyway, it's a powerful ideal. It's, it, you know, a lot of ethical... Uh, power and, and, and there are certain associations that come with it. And it, as I was listening, I thought that you, you did not uh, sort of play that card, although you came sort of right up to the line in two ways. You, 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 uh, near the end of your remarks, you said, we're all, there, you, you, you said in that way, we're all in the image of God. But more pragmatically, you said, even if this person is an offender, even if this person is bugging me, they're still in the image of God. And that felt to me like saying, he's still my brother. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter how he's doing wrong or hurting me or hurting someone else, mm -hmm. he, or she's my sister. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect you have thought about this and, and that you might not just have a simple take on the sibling association of sharing the image. But do you have any comment you want to make on it? Wow, that's really great. I, yeah, I wish I could say, yes, you're right, I have thought about this in great depth and I have this to offer you. I don't, I don't know that I, ha I have along the, the sibling. Uh, what I have spent a lot of time thinking about is more of what I was saying about a, a sense of um, uh, the relationships as, as we are all created that pulls us into relationship with the creator. So I, I can see the sort of sibling nature there. The quote, honestly, that I love for this, which I didn't put in, comes from Walter Rauschenbusch, so one of the founders of the social gospel movement. And um, Rauschenbusch was talking about the sort of perception of pluralism of people. And in, when he's talking about this, he says, you know, there, there are, we look and we see all varieties of people and our roots run down into the eternal life of God. And that was his language. And I, for me, that's really powerful language, that there is a kind of depth of relationship that is beneath perception. And that's a religious conviction. That's hard. You can't show that empirically. But um, I think it is... Um, the Quakers have language about um, living... Uh, oh, I'm not going to get it exactly right now. Um, but it is a kind of living as though this is true, sort of practice theologically and ethically. And I, that connects with me, right? So to, to perceive the, not only the variety, but the forms of uh, disharmony and violence and dis disconnection across people and to know that beneath that, our roots run down into the eternal life of God. So, that's my offering. You've said a lot about uh, agent and violence being the failure to thrive. Can violence be committed against all of God's created order? And, for example, with the Supreme Court and the, the change in the, the legality of abortion in many areas, could one say that an unborn child is not an agent and therefore then violence cannot be committed against that unborn child. Hmm. Well, one can certainly say, and people do, that the unborn is not yet, well, not a person until viability or a person until birth. And so in, in that sense, yeah. But I think, I mean, the, the point about how the Imago Dei enters into a debate like abortion is one of those striking features where people can use this doctrine on both sides um, of that debate. I think the other way that that important question and hard question relates to our conversation is that there are many kinds of violence involved uh, in uh, issues of reproductive freedom and justice and um, maternal health and abortion. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole space that's fraught with different forms of violence, and I think that's important to say. We have one more question from the top. Yeah. Earlier, moral injury was introduced as a part of the theater of war, and that's how I was first introduced to it through chaplaincy training at the James A. Haley Veterans Hospital in Tampa, Florida. 
So what it caused me, and we have veterans in the room. Um, thank you for your service. Um, part of what um, that training invoked in me and caused me to do was to look at moral injury and say, so, okay, NZ, how does it relate to you? How have you participated in moral injury? Because it goes way beyond the theater of war and it starts way before the theater of war. And I'll just share a quick family story. I was raised to be kind to my sisters. I didn't have any brothers. Be kind to my sisters and we couldn't talk about each other and we weren't supposed to curse each other out and we weren't supposed to fight. And one day me and my sister were riding in the car and I would imagine, I may have been around 12, I'm going to have to curse or say something to let you know what I said. And we were arguing about something and I was so mad at Karen and I called her the B word and I will never forget the look that she gave me. I can still see the expression on her face. It was not okay. And I knew that it was not okay because I knew we were not raised to talk to each other like that. That was moral injury because what I said and what I did went and cut to the core of everything and the love that I have for my sister. And I, and, and I have not done that again. Not saying I'm perfect and I don't get upset and for words don't fly because they do. But just to share with you, I feel like at anything that we're addressing and we're looking at, start at home first and how do I experience whatever the issue is and then we can then I can move from where I am into an outward motion of so how does that get lived out in family how does that get lived out in community how does it get lived out in the church and in the world and that just kind of helps me uh, in my centering um, of my way of being and thinking, and it helps me to come up. You use the word framework, and I think frameworks are huge. We have to come up with frameworks of how we're going to live and be in the world with people and understand based on a framework that we can, we can come to terms and to heart with. And so that, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so yeah. I was just gonna say thank you as well. Go, please. Yes, yeah, so thank you all so much for participating, and please join me in thanking all of our guests. Refreshment and conversation. Uh, we'll do that until four o'clock. And the pastors in the room who, who want to participate in the table talk that will start at four o'clock in the event space where the reception is being held. Thank you all again so much for being here. And uh, if you would like to make your way, and let's uh, make her the New York's Times bestseller book list. <laughs> Thank you. So I didn't get to ask earlier the Ott family.